Our next Spark presenter has been driving his company's vision to deliver innovative cloud-based solutions and mHealth technologies to influence and transform the life science industry's approach to bringing new treatments to market. Please welcome founder and president, scientist, inventor, and innovator, Glenn DeVries. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I want to talk to you um, about the possibilities and the impact that technology and data can make in the lives of patients. First, let me talk about biology. We just heard about a rare disease that we are on the cusp of being able to effectively treat. We are in a time where things that would have been science fiction five years ago, 10 years ago, are becoming treatment realities. We have never had this kind of impact in cancer, in therapeutic areas that were death sentences becoming things which are chronic diseases, and chronic diseases which are getting cured. But we're also living in a very interesting time around technology. And it's moving just as fast, if not faster, and I think it can be just as impactful. Um, how many people have a smartphone? All right, that's pretty much every hand. Put, put your hand back up if your smartphone has physical buttons for the keyboard. It doesn't have a keyboard on screen. Any like, couple BlackBerry users out there? I bring this up actually as a cautionary tale. It was only about five years ago that people said it's impossible to have a business smartphone that doesn't have a physical keyboard. We just did a little science at the Healthcare Business Women's Association meeting. Clearly, that hypothesis was wrong. And people who say these technologies, these new ideas, aren't going to change the way people behave, I think, again, need to take a step back and think about technologies in a different way. We are in a hyper-connected world. Everything sends off data and everything receives data more than ever before. That means we can do amazing things. We can break some of the old rules. It used to be impossible to actually diagnose a patient or to evaluate how well a therapy is working without physically transporting that patient to be in front of a healthcare professional or bringing that healthcare professional into the patient's home or room. That's not the case anymore, right? Technology has made it really easy for us to do things like telemedicine. We can get to people anywhere. But we can break other kinds of rules. We can do things around this transmission and receive, the receipt of data that allow us to actually put telemetry on patients. The same way that we might monitor a rocket ship going into space, we can actually monitor a patient. Um, I, uh, I slept in it last night. I showered in it this morning. I'm not going to take my whole shirt off, but just so you know. Um, like, I am, I am wearing a piece of telemetry. It's this little patch. And um, that's me. Uh, you can see I'm a little tachycardic. I'm, you know, I followed some really good speakers, so i got to <laughs> keep it going. Um, but you can imagine now what happens when this kind of data about me to my physician or about a group of patients starts to get pooled. Now this is a medical device, this is super fancy, right? Naysayers and technology, but we'll never all have that. Um, how many people are wearing some kind of, you can turn this off, this is gonna keep making me nervous. Um, how, many people, <laughs> how many people have some kind of wrist-based activity tracker or some kind of fitness thing? Yeah, not that many of you, there are gonna be a lot more over time. By the way, I'm so sorry to publicly tell so many people that they're wrong, but everybody who put up their hand saying they had a smartphone, has a medically relevant device in their pocket that can be used to collect really interesting data. I'll actually, I'll show you um, a uh, slide. Th this is a screenshot from that same phone that I took a couple days ago before coming down here. I put it up for two reasons. One, I don't want any physicians or nurses to think I'm constantly tachycardic. Um, my, my resting heart rate was 56 BPM, that's pretty good. Um, but I put it up because Three interesting things happen when I watch my resting heart rate on this $100 device. Um, one is I am adherent to a particular prescription, in this case one I gave myself, of exercising a certain way. Um, I eat a certain way, and actually I look at this every day. I'm engaged, I own this aspect of my healthcare. Um, if, if literally, if I drink too much, if I don't eat well, if I don't exercise, I will have a resting heart rate in the 60s. And if I do all those things the better way, it's in the 50s. Adherence, lifestyle, patient engagement, these are things that can and will have a meaningful impact 
on the quality of care. They will change outcomes. Let, let's start with adherence. Right? People taking their medications is one of the biggest problems in healthcare. It's a problem for cost, because we pay for all those medications. The patients don't take them correctly or for the entire course, and we don't get the benefit. And it's one of the biggest problems for patients, because you, you think you've taken enough of the medication to be better, and you need to finish it. Maybe um, a lot of people probably experience with antibiotics. That's a perfect example. You don't stop taking them just because you got better. You have to finish it. Uh, I was just having dinner with a, a terrific um, surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon. We were talking about outcomes. What happens in the operating room really matters, but actually what happens after the operating room in terms of physical therapy and the patient taking care of themselves the right way has just as big an impact as how well that case went. So you see cases in, in, in this, these examples where we need to make sure that people are compliant with whatever course of therapy they need to be given. I, actually, there was a study. Um, Cara Dennis, who is the managing director um, of mobile health at, at Medidata, is an HBA rising star, did this study last year. Um, Michelle Marbro, who's another HBA rising star and a leader at Medidata, she's our VP of product strategy, you can bend her ear about this um, if you see her at the conference and you want to hear more about it. But what we tried to do is show that there can be science put on top of the idea of how you engage with a patient to in a meaningful way affect their adherence make sure they are getting the optimal outcome. So with all this miraculous biology going on, there will be an emerging science of adherence, and it will be built on a technological foundation. Let me talk about lifestyle. I talk about eating well or not eating well. Many of you live in the world of science and medicine every day. Um, for some of you, I apologize to take you back to dreaded high school biology class. Um, but let's talk about genotype and phenotype for a second. My genotype, your DNA, you're stuck with it, you can't change it. Um, and ultimately, it plus your environment results in your phenotype, everything that is in you as a physiological organism. Well, actually, that's all correct, but there's more. Phenotype is 100% inclusive of behavior. It's inclusive of cognition. It's how you think. It's how you act. It's everything that you do, your lifestyle, is a part of your phenotype. And we can, with these new kinds of instrumentation, actually not just try to help you change it, eat right, sleep right, stop smoking. We can measure that part of your phenotype in a way that is going to be dramatically impactful to the way we think about diagnosing and treating disease, because it's a new thing that we couldn't scientifically manage before. And, and I actually think we, we just heard an incredibly visceral example of how important that is. Um, I would tell you, I was at a conference uh, a few weeks ago, and um, an FDA reviewer got up, and to his unmitigated credit, he criticized some people in the life sciences industry who happened to be, um, entirely coincidentally, talking about Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And they were, uh, the life sciences company involved, was using a very traditional measurement. They were using something um, that required a patient to be transported, to be in front of a healthcare professional to measure disease progression. And what they found in that part of this clinical trial was that the drug wasn't working. However, if you spoke to the parents, if you heard about people feeding themselves who couldn't feed themselves, if you looked at all the other evidence, if we could have scientifically objectively measured the behavioral changes that this particular drug was causing, it actually would have been an extremely positive clinical trial in his opinion. And it was a call to action to the life sciences industry to start to use these kinds of instrumentation in new scientific ways. This is a tremendous opportunity. The impact will be enormous. And it doesn't matter if you're looking at Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or Alzheimer's disease or anything that might have an impact on the way you move or think or behave in any way. There is going to be a brand new science built on a, a technology foundation of thinking about behavioral and cognitive phenotypes. And that brings me to the last thing. Um, uh, I told you it's about adherence, it's about lifestyle, and it's about patient engagement. Right? I was engaged looking at my resting heart rate. Um, so back in my biology days, I did prostate cancer research. I was thinking about this talk. It's like, okay, what a great way to engage the crowd. I'm going to talk about cancer of an organ that nobody has in the crowd. Um, but, you know, I, 
If, I, you know, if the guys in the room live long enough, we're all going to wind up with it at one point or another. Um, if you spoke in the hospital, I was really lucky. I got to I worked at the bench, but I worked with a lot of patients directly. And you could go up to any patient who was be, being treated for prostate cancer, and they could tell you their PSA. We don't have to talk about what it is. It's a score from your blood. There were people who would come in, and they'd have a little piece of paper in their pocket or a card in their wallet with a little table. Here's, on this day, I had this PSA. On this day, I had this PSA. There was a guy, and I could tell by the, the kind of graph paper he brought. He was clearly an engineer. And he actually had a graph of his PSA over time. He was owning his treatment. He was owning the metrics around his disease, because I guess he was trained that way, maybe, from, from what he did at university. But this was 20 years ago. People don't carry pieces of paper in their pocket anymore. Everybody in the room has a smartphone in their pocket. Everybody has a way to look at various aspects of their health care and to own it. And you know, I work in clinical trials. We're constantly worried about the placebo effect and you know, ha what happens uh, to affect patients' data in a way that might uh, obfuscate the results we're getting the in the experiment. Well, you guys saw what happened when I was in this environment, right, talking to all of you. My heart rate went up. I don't know about some of you, um, uh, this happens to me. There's something called white coat hypertension. If I take my blood pressure at home, it is 100% always lower than even if it's a friend of mine, a doctor or a nurse takes it while they're wearing a white coat in a clinic. These physiological effects, the changes in your physiological phenotype that comes from your environment are real. And maybe you'll regard what I'm about to say as science fiction, or maybe you'll even think it's fantasy, but I think that that is actually something to be, in the best possible way, exploited. And I think there will also be a new science around how we not just take the amazing things from a biological perspective that we're creating in the world of life sciences and empowering healthcare professionals to use to treat patients, but we'll figure out how to use all the technologies that are going to be a ubiquitous part of our lives, medical grade, commercial grade, what's gonna be in everybody's pocket in five years to drive significantly improved outcomes. And it doesn't matter if you work in the world of providers, or if you work in the world of payers, or if you work in the world of pharmas, or you're just a person. Outcomes are what matter. Thank you very much.